Sergeants, if you could prepare your recordings. Sergeant Leonardo, I leave it to you. Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the Committee on Small Business. At this time, we ask that all council members and staff turn on their video for verification purposes. We ask that you please place all cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony for the record, you can do so by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation and we'll begin momentarily. Sergeant Arms, I think we're ready to begin. We are all set, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on the state of small business and one pre-considered intro. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by some of my colleagues and thus far I see Council Member Perkins and Council Member Rivera. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee of Small Business. I'd like you to welcome you to our remote hearing today on the state of small business. The COVID-19 crisis presents the greatest threat to small business economy in modern history. According to a recent report by the city controller, small business revenue have dropped by 25% since January, ranking the greatest city in America 40th amongst the 52 largest American cities during this period. In early April, small businesses had experienced a drop in revenue of over 60%. As small businesses are, are experiencing massive declines in revenue, thousands of small businesses have closed in New York. In his May 22nd press conference, Governor Cuomo reported that over 100,000 small businesses have closed across the state since the pandemic began. According to the city controller report, at, at least 2,800 small businesses closed permanently between March 1st and July 10th. Partnership for New York City predicts that as many as a third of the 230,000 small businesses in New York City may never reopen. That is roughly 75,000 small businesses. Small businesses are not only currently operating on the budget in the, in the negative, but they are now have the added burden of purchasing personal protective equipment or PPE or both to ensure the safety of the employees and create a safe environment for consumers to shop. Restaurants, retail stores, grocery stores, and other establishments have had to retrofit their spaces. According to Dr. Susan Bailey, president of the American Medical Association, the dramatic increase in need for PPE will continue to be a problem for churches, schools, businesses, everyone that's trying to reopen needs PPE, and we're all competing for the same small supply. While I welcome SBS's effort to distribute free face masks during this virus, I'm interested to hear whether the agency has worked to distribute plexiglass, social distancing markers, or any other PPE-related equipment to business owners. As small businesses are forced to increase their expenses with decreased revenue, many small businesses have been unable to pay rent. The Hospitality Alliance surveyed restaurants, bars, nightclubs, and event venues in July and found that over 80% of respondents did not pay their full July rent. I want to emphasize that many landlords in this city hopefully are renegotiating their leases with their tenants in good faith. Some small owners may fear, however, that their inability to pay rent 
may lead their landlord to go after their assets or personal property. This past spring, the council boldly acted to prevent this through the passage of Local Law 55, which temporarily prohibited the enforcement of personal liability provisions in some commercial leases. The pre-considered introduction will extend this necessary bill. The mass closure of city small businesses will leave commercial corridors decimated and unemployment rates high. Households will struggle to feed their families. This city needs a bold vision. This city needs a plan. This administration needs to lobby the federal government to get the small businesses of the five boroughs a lifeline. I look forward to hearing the commissioner's plan today at this hearing as to what the city can do now while we wait for state and federal funds. With that said, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, our legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, our policy analyst, Noah Mexler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for all their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd like to turn it over to my dear friend, Council Member Rivera, to give a statement about her pre-considered intro. Council Member Rivera. Thank you, Chair Jonai, for all of your support and for your advocacy uh, since you started your time in the council. I know we've worked together on a number of bills and I'm looking forward to working to pass this as soon as possible. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak briefly on my pre-considered bill that we are hearing today to extend the prohibition of enforcement of personal liability provisions in commercial leases or rental agreement, agreements involving a COVID-19 impacted tenant. Since we passed my legislation to create this emergency prohibition in May, I have heard from countless small business owners for, of their gratitude and thanks for the city giving them a lifeline when our state and federal government had failed to do so. Just last week, New York Magazine's Chris Crowley interviewed one restaurant owner, Rani Mazumdar, who said that the protections in this bill, and I quote, absolutely and desperately needs to continue it would be a fatal blow to the restaurant industry if they don't extend it. While more than 2,800 businesses in New York City have permanently closed since March 1st, according to data from Yelp, those small business owners can take solace in the fact that their landlords cannot go after their personal life savings and assets thanks to this prohibition. And countless other businesses teetering on the edge can continue to focus on paying workers and supporting their communities without this threat looming over them. While I hoped in May that our federal government would have been able to bring us back to a point where most businesses could fully reopen safely, today that just isn't the case. That is why we are forced to return here today to vote on a six month extension to the prohibition and I'm hoping I'll have your support when this bill is up for a vote. I look forward to hearing today the stories of small businesses, workers, landlords, and others suffering in the midst of this crisis. And while I certainly understand that this law and the proposed extension we're hearing today may not, may not be supported by everyone at this hearing, rest assured that I will continue to push for any and all measures that our city can take to help our communities and those most at risk. Thank you so much. Thank you, council member. And I, I uh, look forward to continuing to work alongside of you as we deal with this devastation uh, from loss of life to devastation of our economy. And we have uh, quite a bit to do. Thank you for that. I wanna turn it over to our moderator, uh, committee council, Stephanie Jones, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, chair. I am Stephanie Jones, counsel to the Small Business Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be Commissioner Doris, the Department of Small Business Services. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony 
at council.nyc.gov. We will now call Commissioner Doris from the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Doris, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Joan I and uh, members of the council, Smith Johnson and others here today. My name is John L. Doris. I'm the commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I hope to uh, take some time today to tell you a little bit about what SBS is doing. Uh, but first, I uh, hope your families and loved ones are doing safe and being safe during this time. It's the most difficult time for us all. It's my pleasure to testify before the city council today on the pre-consideration of intro 1932 that seeks to extend the temporary personal guarantee protection provisions for commercial tenants impacted by COVID-19 until March, 2021. I am grateful for the council's ongoing support and partnership as we work together to advocate for small businesses throughout the city. The economic crisis brought forth by the COVID-19 has been tremendous. Rent challenges for commercial tenants continue to place enormous pressure on our businesses and business owners now more than ever, disproportionately affecting our communities of color. Before the pandemic, small business owners were receiving free legal representation via our commercial lease assistance program as they engaged with their landlords to discuss changes to their lease obligations. Since the program's existence, SBS has assisted over 800 businesses with more than 900 legal issues related to their leases. This program gets at the core of our mission, serving the businesses that need it the most. Over 50% of the total pool of our clients are from women-owned businesses and more than 70% of our clients are minority-owned businesses. In August, the mayor announced the continuation of the program, increasing the funding, allowing us to continue to serve and reach more businesses during this time. Though rent affordability has been an issue that this administration has tackled uh, since its inception, the, fi the financial crisis brought forth by COVID-19 has only heightened these challenges and forced us to think creatively, which is why we are here to speak on the administration's support for the extender bill relating to local law 55 of 2020 which aims to extend the guarantee protection provisions of local law 55 for uh, commercial tenants impacted by COVID-19 until March, 2021. We have heard from our constituents how the bill has allowed them to plan accordingly, allowing business owners to make determinations without having to endure additional losses. Many businesses are planning to make a decision before the end of the month on whether to remain open. This extension allows for further planning and allows them to generate additional income in the absence of federal and state aid. SBS has worked hard to be nimble and adaptable in addressing the challenges faced by our constituents. We have worked tirelessly to connect small business owners to more than 78 million in financial awards, partner with the health DOT and uh, other agencies to launch the Open Restaurants Initiative which has far exceeded our expectations with more than 10,000 participating restaurants since launch. And since pivoting our Workforce One uh, services to an all virtual platform due to the pandemic, we have helped more than 46,000 job seekers and continue to work with more than 700 employers on over 12,000 job opportunities across the five boroughs to ensure that New Yorkers are connected to good jobs. We will continue to think creatively and work collaboratively with the council, city agencies, and our community partners to find ways to further assist our small businesses and job seekers during these times. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to take your questions you may have. Thank you, Com thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to turn it over to questions from Chair Joni. If you could stay unmuted uh, during this question and answer period, that would be great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Doris. I think the world of you and the challenges that we have ahead of us are some very difficult ones. I'm pleased that the administration is supportive of the extender bill that's going to protect some of the uh, small businesses that have personal guarantees. I wonder though, why are we offering that same type of protection to our small businesses when it comes to their inability to pay real estate taxes or water and sewer rates? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, and you know, as you know, uh, this particular bill, this particular bill, uh, you know, we are supportive of the bill and, and other tools in the tools box. Uh, as we mentioned uh, in our last year, and we continue to look at those options, certainly um, it's being uh, taught about, considered even at the state level, uh, which some of those adjustments will have to be made. So, um, you know, we are here again in support of this bill and, and certainly looking for other options and ways that we can be supportive of our small business community, as you know. Um, but so that's certainly on the table and in and, and the conversations happening at the state level. And certainly uh, we look forward to hearing what happens uh, going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. As you can see, I started off with an, a log, an easy question. Um, we'd have it no other way, I'm sure. But again, you're, you're going back to the state. This is within the ability of New York City to offer similar protections by helping small businesses that can't pay city real estate taxes and water and sewer. If we're able to afford these protections to tenants against landlords, which are other small businesses, as government, shouldn't we lead by example? Shouldn't we be there to do our part first in helping alleviate the pain to assure that these businesses can stay afloat to just survive? This isn't even a question about thriving, just surviving. Yeah, certainly. Look, I, you know, you know we've, we've continued work uh, with our small businesses. Um, those who have concerns and issues with uh, where it pertains to taxes, um, you know, our, our partners at DOF have been working with them and initially extending uh, the time and, and, and penalties, et cetera, associated, you know, we are uh, really in a dire time and we do agree with you on that. And um, certainly that is uh, something that was brought up. I know it's being looked at, at multiple levels, uh, but you know, this where the city is right now, um, you know, um, for uh, where our fiscal concerns are, where we are fiscally, I know DOF is working um, with uh, many of those businesses who have asked uh, for help and assistance based upon uh, getting a payment plan together and or other supportive services. So I'm happy to share some of that with you uh, uh, going forward, but certainly um, there is support there, uh, particularly at DOF for, for these businesses. All right. Thank you for that, Commissioner. And by, by support, you mean that we come up with a payment schedule where they still have to pay interest. Uh, that's not real support. Uh, by support, you mean that if they don't pay and they, the agreement that they make, uh, that they won't be foreclosed on. That would be support. Under the current structure of the Department of Finance, if these small businesses don't pay their taxes, they're given grace period, but eventually the property will be foreclosed on. And that's my point that we always ask others to do their part, but yet we never show ourselves and we should lead by example. We need to do more. We'll continue this. I know that it's not in your hands. We've had this dialogue before, but I keep reiterating that we can't have a double standard. We can't hold other industries responsible and expect them to do their share when government is not willing to make the same sacrifices uh, that we ask others to do. You did mention you brought up restaurants and we talk about a very volatile and extremely important industry in New York City. What are we doing for restaurants to help them reopen? What have we done so far? Well, thank you so much for that uh, question. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we did something that was certainly um, you know, creative and outside of the box with our open restaurants program. Uh, we were able to now sign up about 10,000 restaurants to that program. Originally, we thought 
we would have about maybe 5,000 or so restaurants who would participate and about maybe 49,000 jobs to come back. We have 10,000 businesses there and about 90,000 uh, jobs uh, who came back uh, because of that program. Uh, so we've been supportive of our restaurants. We have, uh, you know, did uh, virtual compliance checks with them also to make sure that they're setting up accordingly. Our team at SBS, uh, we have instituted our hotline, which you know, uh, 35,000 plus calls, a uh, significant portion of them with our restaurant and uh, industry and guiding them, helping them to understand how they can come back. And, and so that 10,000 is really a lot of work that we put in uh, to uh, assist in our uh, restaurants to get the support they need. We've also uh, did outbound calls and, and on-site visits, myself, uh, going to corridors all around the city to speak to the restaurant owners, understanding the challenges that they have. We've given and distributed uh, PPE to those restaurants, uh, speak, speak, uh, spoke to them and understand uh, their challenges and getting the necessary PPE, even for their customers who are coming that may not have a mask, to give them extra so that they have it. So. Uh, we've done that, just the technical support, the training, but also created a program in which brought some life back to our city. So many of our restaurants that we love dearly are open uh, and are, are getting to, to come out and beginning to uh, really uh, take a turn uh, based on the availability of this program. Thank you. So by creativity, you're saying the Open Sidewalks program, obviously. Yeah, the open sidewalks and the street, right? I mean, certainly the processes that we've had to, those programs were lengthy uh, and uh, we were able to do this very nimbly. Uh, the restaurant self-attest, that, that's coordination with DOT um, and their work that they're doing. Um, certainly our work, uh, making sure that the restaurant's voices are being heard at the table and also we're training the restaurant's owners on, on, on this new regulatory environment so that uh, everyone is on the same page and also those restaurants who are not participating, that they have an opportunity to participate. So I believe the number is 27,000 restaurants called New York City Home? Yes, uh, we have about 27,000 uh, food establishments, could do also include food establishments and hotels and other places, but yes, we're about 27,000. So roughly a third of them have taken you up on this creative thinking, which allows them to reopen outdoors. At their own expense, of course. Not that we provided them with anything more than a waiver of fees. Yeah, I mean, so the what we've done was um, we allowed them to open outdoors. Um, also, they can utilize uh, their existing furniture. Um, so we didn't. The cost, I believe, most of restaurants mentioned that the the cost was just to acquire some bar the barricades to make sure that they're compliant if they are in the street. Outside of that. Restaurants are utilizing their own uh, equipment, existing equipment, um, and the city, again, uh, did not, uh, there's no cost there associated with that transaction. It's a self attestation. But again, it was an expense on the restaurants to have to invest in these barriers, which they put up originally, and then thereafter had to replace them. Many of them were, according, um, uh, were not conforming to the city's requirements yeah. after they were approved and installed. And they were then again hit with a second expense of replacing the existing barriers that they had put up, which were originally approved in one manner or another. Commissioner, I'm grateful for what, for what you're saying, but it's only a third of the businesses. And my understanding, that's roughly 25% of the total business that these restaurants do. Yeah, and absolutely. Look, we, we understand, uh, look, we're, we're in a pandemic, as you know, um, and the challenge that we have is to balance both the health components and given a really a uh, simple and a low cost uh, way to get our restaurant communities back up and running for all of us to go back and, and patronize those restaurants and go back to our local restaurants and make sure that those jobs come back and those, that industry and that supply chain um, is engaged again. So uh, Mr. Chair, I agree with you. I mean, we, we, we certainly uh, understand the limitations of the outdoor. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we get something going. The restaurant industry, I believe is 
extremely uh, supportive and appreciative of our efforts here. And we are of them. I mean, you know, they are resilient. Our New York City businesses are resilient. They're doing everything they can to survive. And we were there with them and are there with them, making sure that this program, again, remains simple and low cost in order for our, to get our restaurants back up and running. And certainly the, the, the third of them are participating at the moment. Uh, we did outbound calls um, to those who are not yet in the program, uh, several thousands of those uh, to reach out to them. Some restaurants uh, or some uh, uh, establishments or takeout uh, uh, only, or they do uh, orders only, um, you know, and, and, and delivery only. And, and that's just how they, their business uh, operates. Uh, others, um, you know, were happy to hear from us and said, yes, we're going to sign up. And so we continue to reach out to the corridors and areas where we're not seeing some activity, and particularly in some of our LMI communities. And we want to make sure uh, that they have the information and what it takes to actually do this program about five to 10 minutes uh, at the station, and they can actually go and start utilizing the program. Well, thank you for that, Commissioner. The winter months are upon us, and for those restaurants to now invest in those barriers and whatever other investment is needed is not going to pay for itself, let alone produce any profits. And I bring up the restaurant industry aside from all other industries, because you refer to this pandemic that we have that is a health concern for all, but yet we hold our restaurants to a standard that no other industry is being held to. And it's very difficult for me and for New Yorkers, as well as those businesses, to understand the logic. Our subways are open. There's no social distancing. There's no cleaning routine. There's no oversight of mask and PPE. Uh, no one knows what those riders are being exposed to. We opened up retail outlets. You can walk into a mall now and go shopping, get your hair done, your nails done, seek other services. And if you're a gym, you can even get a workout within that same mall. But if you're a restaurant, as of right now, you cannot dine indoors under the same roof, being utilized by the same customer. At the same opening hours, we put an unfair restriction on restaurants. And if it wasn't for a recent lawsuit, the mayor said not until well into 2021 will our restaurants be able to open for indoor dining. It took a lawsuit for this city to wake up and acknowledge that rightfully, wrongfully so, they were not allowing for indoor dining. There was no scientific metric behind it. There was no reasoning or rationale. It was more like a form of punishment than anything else. So that same industry that you're referring to that we've done so much for, We've undermined their very existence without reason or understanding. 25% of indoor dining capacity and more forced regulations. Our restaurant industries, our food and beverage industries will not be able to survive. And when those businesses close down, they will not reopen. And the double standard that we've imposed on them is immoral, illegal, and unjustifiable. So when you have your meetings, as you regularly do, with this administration, let's stop the double standard. If 50% capacity is permitted throughout the state with higher infection rates, New York City restaurants should have the same affordability to survive. There is no reason for the double standard or the other regulations that are being imposed. And I know that we've been joined by several other committee members. We have Council Member Rosenthal, as well as Council Member Levine. Um, and I have one last question before I turn it over to the other council members. At a recent small business committee hearing, in response to one of my questions, you said the administration would consider adding more funding 
to the COVID small business grant and loan programs past the initial 49 million allocated earlier this year, which we all understand is not nearly enough. What is the status of this issue? Should struggling small business expect to have additional grant and loan relief from City Hall? And will it be equally dispersed amongst the outer boroughs versus the initial phase where Manhattan benefited overwhelmingly? Thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, uh, certainly first on, on the restaurant question, um, you know, we are, we've seen, uh, I believe, around uh, the country and the world that restaurants really being the only location in which um, the requirement to keep a face covering uh, is, is different when you're indoors and you're able to sit and take the face covering off. Um, and so it's a bit of a different of a health challenge that we've heard from the health experts, um, why it's unique uh, for indoor dining. Um, certainly we support our restaurants, we wanna make sure that we do get indoor dining going. The, the, the governor, as you mentioned, did give the go ahead for New York City to do indoor dining at 25% capacity. Um, certainly that was came because of a lot of work for about 30 days now, we've seen um, infection rates down. Uh, we've seen uh, that the, the virus as much as we can, we're doing everything we can to control the spread, less than 1%. And so we're, we're very excited about the 25% um, added with what we have now with the outdoor dining, um, we, we feel that our restaurants, or we've heard from our restaurant community, particularly uh, of the excitement of at least having the opportunity to start on the indoor dining, particularly as we get into the colder months. As it pertains to uh, the loan and the grants and loan uh, funds, uh, yeah, we are certainly, um, uh, you know, um, concerned about, you know, the number of, as you know, the number that uh, went to certain communities or certain boroughs. And, and again, our five borough strategy, as we continue to say, is that everything we've done since I became commissioner have, have been a five borough strategy in, in the sense that we're going to every borough. I've been in every borough multiple times dealing with all the businesses and communities and uh, community partners in those uh, very deliberately uh, in the outer boroughs, making sure that we're addressing their concerns and needs and we'll continue to do that. Um, we understand that Right now, the city does not have, uh, you know, the financial uh, ability right now to, to feed that uh, loan and grant program with additional funds, as mentioned last time. And this is why we've asked to lobby really hard on the, on the stimulus that's uh, from the federal government. And then also uh, to get a long-term borrowing from the state, uh, the ability to do that. I think that will then give us an opportunity uh, to do more programming, additional resources, uh, funding, et cetera, uh, for our small businesses. And so uh, we appreciate the council's support uh, for long-term borrowing at the state level. And, and certainly I believe that's gonna help us to get uh, to where we need to do, uh, get some additional support. And also lastly, I say, we are working with other groups um, and, and, and we'll probably be uh, making some of those uh, uh, you know, more public uh, with other groups, other organizations, um, you know, really to think about what we can do when it comes to funding, um, other financial institutions trying to come up with some additional resources and solutions uh, for our small businesses at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. But we have Thank to you, let sir. you know, we did not properly, um, the limited funding, which was uh, crumbs at best, were not equally distributed to the outer boroughs. I can't let this go. The out of boroughs are not ready to let that go. And it's a wrong that has to be righted. And the only way you can do that is by showing them how much you really care. And that's by putting up the money. You need to relook at this. And I'm disappointed that you don't have an update on, on this. When you last said you would be looking into it and relying on the state and the federal government for help that may never come is not an answer. Our outer borough businesses were not afforded the same assistance as Manhattan at some gross numbers. 
So I'm going to continue to hold you on this issue. And I'm going to ask you to figure out where we can find that funding and who you have to take it away from, but to give it to those that rightly, rightfully deserve it. And I'm going to call on Council Member Rivera, who has a few questions, and I'll pass it back to Stephanie Jones, who will be re asking other members for questions. I warned them up for you, <laughs> Council Member Rivera. I know you did. I just wanted to make sure usually someone yells time, but um, okay. So I thank you so much, uh, Chair Joan. I thank you to the commissioners, of course. So um, clearly you stated that your uh, position is in support of the bill. And I thank you very, very much uh, for supporting the extension. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I heard pretty clearly. Have you heard from any landlords, um, any stories related to landlords violating the current prohibition? And how are you working to enforce the one that is in place today? Well, thank you for that uh, question, Council Member. Um, uh, we've heard from business owners um, who have uh, appreciated the current bill and certainly how it's constructed. Um, we have not heard um, from landlords um, on the bill who are either uh, not supportive or supportive. Um, we generally are working with uh, the uh, business owners um, themselves. And um, we've heard though, which I think it's uh, a great piece in addition to what we're doing here is that um, there has been an increase in landlords who are looking to negotiate and renegotiate uh, with their tenants based upon uh, the inaction of this law, which I think it's uh, what we were looking to do, right? I think it's meeting, um, uh, you know, meeting where we are, where we need to be. I know a lot of landlords also, uh, you know, with the, uh, the court, uh, waiting on the court decision, I guess, to see where they will go. Uh, but for us, um, we're hearing a lot of, uh, you know, praises for this bill from the small business community. Um, certainly want to make sure that we uh, are supportive of them during this time. Um, and so as it pertains to enforcement, um, you know, again, uh, you know, SBS, we're not an, an enforcement agency. We're here to support our small businesses, uh, but we have not heard of extensive uh, issues around enforcement of this. Uh, we've heard uh, quite the opposite, uh, which is landlords actually trying to work with tenants now um, to help them uh, during this time. That's great. And that was absolutely one of the intentions of, of putting forward this bill was to not just protect our small business owners who are really just such important New Yorkers to us that keep the city moving, that are the lifeblood, but also to show to some of these landlords that um, we really are trying to do everything we can to support a fair and effective negotiation. We realize everybody's in hard times. Uh, but that increase in landlords looking to negotiate new lease terms was absolutely a positive side effect of the bill that I put forward that we're hoping to extend today. And of course, I think what complements that is something that the city uh, did restore after much advocacy from myself, from a number of advocates, which is the commercial lease assistance program, which is that city program to help people negotiate legal lease terms. And so I'm so glad that that was restored and I hope it continues uh, to be restored and looked at for an, even an increase going forward. Um, it's a really, really important piece, especially for minority and women owned businesses and entrepreneurs, which I know you have a heavy, heavy focus on even pre tenure as the SBS commissioner. So do you know how many businesses have contacted your agencies con concerning potential financial exposure from a personal liability clause? Um, no, we do not have an exact number of, of uh, businesses who have contacted us for that specific uh, question. Um, again, you know, I think we were supportive and supportive now because the general consensus is, and we, you know, we, we talk to small businesses all the time, uh, either in our commercial lease assistance program or even those we are um, forwarding to our pro bono uh, partners and or to our hotline, et cetera, but you know, certainly we do not have a list. Um, on the commercial lease assistance program, if I just may, you know, we did, uh, the mayor did 
increase uh, the annual allotment there from 1.2 to 1.5 million. So additional 300,000 was put in the program to further assist our small businesses. And, you know, you're right about, you know, um, you know, those who receive assistance through that program historically have been 52% are, are women, 70% um, are minority owned businesses, 52% are immigrant businesses, and 62% really to uh, Council Member Jonai's uh, question around borough diversity, 62% uh, of all cases are from the out of boroughs. And so this program is an ideal program. Um, and we look to continue, uh, you know, advancing that program now, even in this critical time. Absolutely. And, and I, I thank you. And, and I'm sure all of the nonprofits involved. Thank oh, you. Amazing. We were fighting uh, pretty uh, voraciously on, on this one. So I guess my, my last question, and, and Chair Joan and I did ask this um, in a way, uh, for sure, uh, but I wanted to ask again, because I do have many, many constituents who ask me this question, and, and I, wanna, I wanna answer them directly. I prefer to answer them in a list form, in a comprehensive email that I could send them about resources. So in the wake of the city shutting down its loan and grant programs, what are SBS and DCA doing to support small businesses impacted by COVID? We have the Commercial Lease Assistance Program. I know there is a hotline for questions. Can you just list very quickly some of what your agencies are doing separately and collaboratively specifically to help uh, these businesses impacted by COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I, you know, you said a few of them. So uh, resources uh, that we have uh, for our small businesses, we do have the hotline, um, which is our clearinghouse essentially for our small business, making sure that they have all the resources they need and connecting them to the various places that they need to go to. Um, then we also have, uh, you know, our guidance uh, that we give and technical assistance and support. And you know, sometimes we hear that and we don't understand what it really means to say, well, technical assistance and support. Well, it helps a business make a critical decisions as to you know, how to pivot, what to do during this time. We do that uh, over 115 uh, webinars, 3,500 attendees, uh, again, with the digital resources, helping these businesses to understand the new world we're in. We're also giving out uh, PPE, um, face coverings, et cetera, over 5 million distributed, 7.5 million we have on hand to assist our uh, small businesses. We also do reopening compliance cons uh, consultations. Um, again, free uh, consultations to with one-on-one -on -one with the, the business owner and uh, SBS um, to assist them. We also are doing uh, things for employees of those businesses. For instance, we launched our career discovery portal um, that has launched, we already have 700, uh, this is actually last month, 775 people looking to sign up to get training, additional skills around coding and web development, which will then help their uh, particular businesses that they're going to work for um, to pivot and to do uh, what they need to do in advance and forward. We're also, again, uh, we have not, you know, stopped uh, working with um, our uh partners are 40 lending uh, partners that we have here at the city um, to get financial assistance into the hands of our small businesses. We've already done 78 million, over 4,000 of those bus uh, businesses already. And so those are some of the programs we have. Um, and lastly, uh, where the council member, Joe and I mentioned the PPE. And so we, we, we created a marketplace, online marketplace. Uh, that you can go to um, and we brought the resources to uh, the businesses to make it easy for them to find uh, those particular um, uh, PPE that they may need. And so, yeah, you know, we're doing quite a bit uh, and that and then and, and a lot more, uh, but that's a, a somewhat of a summary. We're happy to send you along all this information, but um, you can certainly go to nyc.gov forward slash business. All the opening resources are there for, for those um, the small businesses out there. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm tomorrow I'm having a, a meeting. Uh, it's really just a Facebook live hour that I do on certain topics, bringing in a small business owner, bringing in Pace University small business program. And I want to make sure that we're highlighting some of the things that you're working on. So I just wanted to give you this opportunity to list 
the eight or so things that you're trying to offer small businesses. I realize we have to ramp it up. And I agree with my colleagues that there are a few things that the city can do. I know that you're not an enforcement agency, but you do work collaboratively with DCA who is, who institutes a number of fines in some of these businesses that we should explore. Some of them seem a bit punitive. And then the other is just to, um, you know, make sure that we're planning for a federal government that clearly has left us behind. So I wanna just thank you for your time and for answering my questions and to Chair Joe Nye for being uh, so gracious with allowing me to ask these questions. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, Commissioner, uh, I'm not sure if there's any one of the other members queue to ask questions, but were you alarmed by the statistic that a third of our small businesses may not open? A third. Yeah, look, you know, it is, uh, it is our work every day to try to beat back that prediction. Uh, it is our drive every day to make sure that uh, that does not come true, right? Um, you know, SPS was created for this moment, uh, really, to make sure that our small businesses have a way forward. And so alarm, yes, we were extremely alarmed. We are every single day alarmed at, you know, what we are hearing based upon, again, no fault of the small business owners themselves, but the fact of we do have a pandemic that's ensued in the city and in the world, um, which is constricted markets and stop folks from actually having to engage in business in the way that we have. So one of the things that we want to do and we've been doing, and that's why I've been out and about as much as possible, really is to bring some consumer confidence back. You know, consumer confidence is down. Uh, we want to bring the consumer confidence back to shop in your local area, shop with your local businesses, work with your small businesses in your area to make sure uh, that you support them, um, not just, you know, be on online all the time, you know, buying from, you know, large corporations, um, you know, support your local business, support your local, uh, you know, bookstore, so your lo local art store, your local coffee shop, lo your local retail establishment. Uh, you know, we're promoting that, we're pushing that. We want to build consumer confidence because we know uh, to lose a third of our businesses unconscious. We can't think about that. We, there's something that uh, you know, it, it really hits at the core of what New York City is and, and that will be taken away. So we certainly are with you on that. And that's why we're here. That's why we do the work we do. So I look forward to working with you, Commissioner, on the consumer behavior changes by educating them the, and the, of the importance of shopping locally. Absolutely. We've begun Absolutely. the conversation. We're going to be dealing with the other commissioners uh, including the EDC on getting that message out. Um, the sooner the better. It takes a while for consumer behavior changes to, to yeah. adjust uh, and to make that understand that every dollar that is spent locally stays locally and the benefit is threefold and fourfold. Uh, we have our work cut out in that regard. But given the wherewithal, what do you think the top two things that we can do for our small businesses to prevent the catastrophe of 30% or a third of our businesses not reopening. And just to put that thing in perspective, during the same period of the 52 largest American cities, New York City is ranked 40th. That's where we've stooped to. So it's no longer, we don't want to think about it. It's there. And the rest of the country is somehow muscling through this, what is it that we're not doing? And given the wherewithal, what would you want to do? And don't go back to the state and federal government. What can New York City do today besides consumer behavior changes? Oh yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, hello? Yep, we're here. Yeah, okay, can. sorry. I'm sorry. Something popped up said that I was not no longer on. Um, no, thank you so much for that question, uh, Council Member. Um, look, there, there, there's so much that we can do, and I think we are doing it. I think we have to deepen that. Certainly, uh, you know, in size and scale and scope, you have 240,000 uh, businesses um, compared to the other cities, uh, you know, who certainly have that challenge that we have. The, the fact that we were the epicenter of this uh, virus um, continues to be a challenge that other cities are not facing. 
Commissioner, I think we're losing you. I think we lost the commissioner. Um, so I'm going to have to turn it back to Stephanie Jones uh, as she starts. Oh, I think he's back. Connection. Are you able to hear me, sir? Uh, we are, and it's perfect. Okay, sir. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what's going on with the connection here. Uh, but but I was just saying that that uh, you know we have several uh, differences as you know with with these other cities. I mean you know the, the the fact that we were at the epicenter, the fact that we have two hundred forty thousand uh, small businesses here that we are working with on a daily basis. Uh, certainly the challenge is unique in the city of New York. Uh, but the things that we can do, um, I you know there there are two two big things. One is we got to continue to get resources into the hand of small business. And you're right. It's not just the federal government or the state government, but we are doing that um, with connecting them to the financial resources. One way that we can do that is for all of us to come together around the business interruption insurance challenge. I mean, that is something that we, if we can fix that, um, you will save more small businesses than any loan or grant program can initially do uh, right now, we have uh, these insurance uh, companies sitting on $800 billion uh, of revenue and that we're unable to tap into right now because of, of that. Um, and uh, we want to make sure uh, that we are able to uh, get to uh, these, uh, you know, business interruption insurance, um, you know, so that we can actually get these businesses run again. That is something big. We just heard of you know, Century uh, 21, uh, being able to now have to actually shut down and file for bankruptcy because of the same issue. Now, if they're having that challenge, what about a small business? What about our small businesses? So that is something that we need. That is something that we need, okay, uh, to get <laughs> the support on. Um, it's a state issue. It's a federal issue. We need that uh, ASAP. And then lastly, I believe if, you know, what else do we need? Uh, you know, yes, we need to build consumer confidence. Yes, we need the business interrupt insurance, uh, but we also need to think about regulatory reform. And it's something that we're thinking through, you know, what do we do? How can we make the, our world in the city, our small business world, uh, you know, more uh, attractive to our small businesses? What do we need to do from a regulatory standpoint uh, to take care of a lot of the things that you've been saying, sir. And, and also we've been hearing from our small businesses. How do we streamline our processes? Um, we're looking into all these pieces to make sure uh, that our businesses stay afloat and they survive this time. Thank you, Commissioner. My, my follow-up to that, and there, I agree with you that business interruption insurance is significant. I'm out there every day talking to consumer and to small business. Consumer says, I can't shop locally. I'm afraid to shop locally. Look at my commercial corridor. I feel threatened. I don't feel safe based on what is happening. My small businesses say, I can't stay afloat. Look at the illegal vendors that are outside of my location competing against me where they're not paying income tax, sales tax, or any tax, have no regulation. That inspector walks by them, and he showed me in a video, the inspector walking by a number of illegal street vendors, absolutely no compliance, and into a brick and mortar establishment to make sure that they are complying. So commissioner, we have a lot more to do. And it's more than consumer behavior changes and more than business interruption insurance. Let's clean up our streets. Let's give these businesses a fighting chance by cracking down on the illegal activity that is competing against them by making our streets safer so consumers don't have to shop online, that they feel comfortable walking into an establishment and purchasing and patronizing that small business. I am happy to discuss this with you, provided that we can come up with a concrete solution to this problem that is 
fixable. It is fixable and uh, addressable immediately. You don't have to respond, Commissioner. Oh, so. If you'd like, if you'd like to, I'd love to hear your response. No, I, I, I'm saying absolutely we would like to continue that conversation. You know, we work with our, our bids, um, you know, around the city um, who uh, we support, uh, you know, uh, with grants, with, with, with governance, assistance, and, and et cetera, uh, to make sure that their, their corridors and corridors, even, and by the way, a lot of our, our bids have went above and beyond, um, even now working with uh, areas outside of their their corridors and uh, making sure during this time that they're being assistance to other uh, business communities. So, look, I hear you. This is a real concern. Um, we want to we want to continue to address it. And so, uh, happy to have those conversations um, and to work through uh, your thoughts and, and certainly what we're hearing from our bids and our other uh, commercial corridors, merchants associations, etc. What we're hearing from folks and how we can be better, uh, you know, better assist them during this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Stephanie Jones uh, to call on those that want to testify. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelists has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. I would like to now welcome uh, Andrew Riggi, followed by Karen Narevsky, and then Robert Bookman. Andrew? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Joni, Council Members, Council Member Rivera. Uh, you know, when this legislation passed uh, earlier this year to suspend the enforcement of personal liability guarantees uh, in leases, this is one action the council took that has helped save countless small business owners. You know, people have put their livelihoods into these small businesses. And the fact that they could not only lose their business, and then their landlords could go after their personal assets, their savings, their homes, just created so much fear and uncertainty. So we at the New York City Hospitality Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization representing restaurants and nightlife venues throughout the five boroughs, strongly support uh, the extension of this uh, law. We conducted a survey and we've been doing it monthly, but to the most recent one, uh, about 500 restaurants in the five boroughs responded and 83% of them had paid no rent or partial rent. Uh, and only one in 10 had been able to renegotiate their leases. So we are still in a dire situation. It was just announced, thankfully, uh, that September 30th, we will begin indoor dining at a 25% reduced occupancy. But let's keep in mind pre-pandemic that when restaurants had 100% occupancy, uh, they could barely even survive in many cases. So I can't explain how important extending this law is uh, to the future of our small businesses. And I also think it's important to note that, you know, many small restaurant owners I've spoken with if this law wasn't in effect and they know they did not have this protection, they may just toss their keys in right now, even though otherwise they had a successful restaurant that they hope one day they could uh, bring back. So again, this law is just so important. We thank you for your consideration in extending it. Uh, we think it also helps support the city of New York, because if you've heard me say so many times, I see no way our city ever recovers unless our restaurants and our nightlife are at the core of that recovery. And this law helps them do that while they figure out how they are ever going to work so hard to have their business recover. So again, we strongly support this legislation. It's going to protect small business owners from financial ruin personally and give them the opportunity to do what we need them to do. Focus their efforts on rebuilding their restaurants so when the time is right, we can hopefully have them here, not only for the immediate time, but really during the long-term recovery 
and for years and years into the future. So I want to thank you all for your consideration. My colleague Robert Bookman is also here, uh, and he's able to speak on some additional issues. But I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. But we urge the committee and the council to pass this legislation and urge Mayor de Blasio to enact it into law because we need to support our small business owners. This bill does exactly that. It takes action, critically important. I can't stress it enough, and I want to thank you all. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rivera has a question for you. Hi, hi there. Hello. Thanks for being here time and time again. Um, I know that you mentioned you've been, you know, reached out to, and I mentioned in my opening testimony, I can't really count how many people have counted, have, have reached out to me about this issue, whether like on Instagram or, you know, just social media DMs uh, emails, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a lot of that is because of the advocacy uh, of the Alliance. Do you know how many of your members have been impacted by personal liability clauses during COVID-19? And how many uh, guests have you heard from since my bill took effect? Well, so I don't have a, a, a hard number for you, but what I can tell you is I have imparted phone calls, text messages, everything you can imagine the same way, you know, direct messages, you know, by hundreds, I'm sure it's thousands. I mean, you, if you look at the 25,000 plus eating and drinking establishments pre-pandemic, the vast majority of them are small business owners, meaning that there is a likelihood that they do have one of these personal liability guarantees in their leases. So, I mean, I expect the number is in the thousands. I can just tell you from my experience, it's almost everyone I've spoken to tells us how important this law is. And without it, they would probably just have to toss back their keys now, um, which would be horrible for the city because then we know no matter what we do, we're not gonna get these restaurants back. Um, but we also know the underlying issue is that people's personal assets are on the line. And when we talk about people particularly living here in the city, we need to keep our New Yorkers here. And to do that, they're gonna have their, need their resources and resources. So um, again, I expect the numbers is in the thousands um, I've heard around the clock. And I've been continually asked, you know, this is getting extended, right? This is getting extended. So, um, you know, that's the best answer I can give you. I hope it's somewhat sufficient. <laughs> No, I and it, it means a lot to know that people have reached out to you. I mean, that was the point of the bill, right? Is is to help our neighbors and to help our city on a road back to recovery. Um, again, when the federal and, and and state level governments haven't really done as much as we'd like. So, I guess my my last question is just, what else should the city and state be doing to support your members? I mean, we've mentioned business interruption insurance. Uh, there is, you know, the rent relief that's desperately needed or maybe just extending outdoor dining. I think there's like small fixes and extensions um, that we could start with. And then the bigger things, which is like finally waiting for some sort of package to pass in Congress. Short of waiting for that, which I always prepare for, for doomsday, that's more my style is to prepare for the worst possible scenario. You know, I, I remember I wrote a letter to Cuomo and, and the mayor back in March asking for some of these things. Mm -hmm. So what are what else can we be doing to support your members now? Thank you. So good question. There's a list. Certainly, you know, more locally, the state does have the business interruption insurance bills. I think giving people a plan for outdoor dining, what it's going to look like post October 31st going into next year, using heat lamps, giving them confidence so they can plan, um, allowing cure periods and uh, warnings for any violations that don't pose immediate hazards um, to the public. I think, although I know there's a cost involved with it, there's also a cost not doing anything. A lot of these small business owners, they pay a portion of the property taxes um, as part of their lease agreements finding a way to reduce those payments um, would be so important because they are going to literally pump those savings right back into the local economy and wages, purchasing from local vendors, including, you know, the farmer upstate. That's a way that we can help reduce those expenses, things like 
the commercial rent tax. Um, also allowing uh, restaurants to add a clearly disclosed uh, COVID surcharge to a bill is going to be very important. Um, I know there's legislation uh, to do that, help them cover the cost of PPE, uh, help them rent all these other expenses that they have, employee wages. Um, we need to save these small business owners. Uh, currently, restaurants, believe it or not, are the only industry in the city of New York I'm aware of that are prohibited from adding a clearly disclosed surcharge um, to their checks. I mean, every other industry can do it. In fact, every other restaurant throughout the rest of the state and country can also do it. So I think that's an option that could help many of these restaurants. Um, uh, you know, Rob's going to speak a little bit later. You know, there are some additional issues with permits and licensing to speed up the process. Um, and I can send you, we have a list of probably about 40 or 50 policies, ideas that could be done at all levels of government. Some of them will have an immediate help like the surcharge issue, like a reduction in taxes, um, like allowing, allowing cure periods for violations. Um, but I think part of it is really looking at this long-term is how can we take this crisis and make long-term changes to operating a restaurant here in the city of New York? Um, and how do we reduce them and enhance the experience? And I think things like the outdoor dining is a perfect example where pre-COVID, you needed to go through an expensive and lengthy permitting process to get outdoor dining. But look, we're able to stand up the process really quickly and take out so much of that bureaucracy. Um, so I think where there's a will, there's a way. And those are just a handful of uh, ideas. And there's certainly a whole bunch more where uh, they came from. Thank you. And I, I know you will have an extensive list. I mean, I think we've all been right, writing letters and compiling reports of all these different great ideas out there that are being championed by so many people. And so, but just hearing you say it with the clear urgency that is needed is just something that I think is always important for us to just ring the alarm in these spaces. So thank you for all that you do and, and for your team. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me uh, to ask these questions. Thank you, Assembly Member. I will hand it back to CJ now, who is gonna go down the list of those that are testified. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. My name is CJ Murray. I will be taking over as committee counsel for the remainder of the hearing. Uh, I would now like to welcome Karen Norevsky to testify. After Karen, I will be calling on Robert Bookman, followed by Jane Locke. Karen Norevsky, you may begin. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks, Chair Jonah and uh, members of the committee and Council Member Rivera. Uh, my name is Karen Norevsky. Uh, I'm the Senior Organizer for Equitable Economic Development at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, NHD is a nonprofit whose mission is to build community power to win affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. Um, and as part of that work, we're a member and a convener of United for Small Business New York City, a coalition of community organizations um, across the city fighting to protect, especially owner-operated minority-run small businesses from the threat of displacement. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to testify in support of this legislation. We supported um, Local Law 55 when it was first introduced, um, and we certainly believe that it should be extended through March 2021 as proposed. Um, so, of course, some of the businesses that have closed in April have been able to reopen in a limited capacity, but um, the public health requirements of operating during the pandemic have only increased financial strain. Um, and many of the businesses that we work with and, and nonprofit cultural and other spaces um, rely on public assembly and on people coming together, and they may not be able to be fully operational for long after um, the period ends. Uh, so the challenges to small businesses are really numerous and they've been um, touched on very eloquently in this hearing. Um, so this is a, an important way to, uh, to ensure some protection um, for the individuals who are running those businesses and ensure that their livelihoods are not ruined along with the potential risk to their business. Um, we do believe that the legislation would benefit from some additional clarity uh, making sure that it includes um, personal guarantees that are executed simultaneously with leases but aren't actually part of the lease document. Um, this is a fairly common practice in signing commercial leases and we would want to make sure that business owners that have signed a separate guarantee 
um, of personal liability would also be protected. Um, and to make sure that some small businesses actually sign leases in the name of DBA doing business as or in the business owner's name rather than in the business's name. Um, and while these business owners have not signed personal guarantees, they still face substantial financial risk. Um, and we think they should be protected from personal liability as well. Um, but overall, uh, we're very supportive of this legislation and of the council's intent uh, to continue providing this really important relief to some of the city's most vulnerable small businesses and their employees. Um, we have heard from businesses that our members work with um, that uh, you know, are relying on this relief and it's really important to them um, in a time when they're not able to operate their business. Um, and we also just want to encourage the council to really continue to pursue um, measures of rent relief and other financial support for small businesses to ensure that those who are still here can weather the long-term effects of the, of the virus as much as possible. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. Seeing no hands raised, I would now like to welcome Robert Bookman to testify. After that, I will be calling on Jane Locke, followed by A Young Kim. Robert Bookman, you may begin. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Jonai, Council Member Rivera, to my favorite council people, thank you for doing this today. Uh, listen, personal liability clauses, or as we call them, good guy clauses in the, uh, in the industry, were never intended to apply to this unprecedented situation of government shutting down businesses for months on end. In, in fact, Personal guarantees, like other uh, documents, like that, uh, and have gotten a lot of scrutiny lately. Um, mandatory arbitration clauses uh, and no non-disclosure agreements are really intended to get around the law. I mean, our corporate laws in the state of New York are designed to to protect individuals. They form a corporation. The corporation goes into business. It's supposed to protect their personal assets. That's the whole purpose of corporate law. Um, these uh, personal guarantees are at their root designed to get around the law. Um, and in normal times, it's not, you know, it, it, you can deal with it because uh, you have opportunity, if your business is not doing well, to turn in your keys, give it, give it a, a, an appropriate notice without having any personal liability. But now we don't have that opportunity. And mom and pops are only technically in possession, but they cannot open or operate their business effectively for months. And that's because of a government mandate. So yes, in such an unprecedented emergency, it is not only appropriate for government to intervene, uh, but it, it, is, it is a moral imperative for government to protect the thousands of small business owners, the ones most likely to have personal guarantees, because large corporations, when they sign these leases, aren't, don't need the personal guarantees, um, to, protect, uh, to protect these businesses that protect our city and our commercial corridors from becoming blighted and ghost towns, uh, which would negatively impact our quality of life, public safety, sanitation, you know, et cetera. Um, and this law has been very effective. Um, as an attorney, you know, with a very small little country practice, I could tell you I know of dozens of clients just, uh, you know, in, in my practice that but for this law would have already been forced to turn in their keys uh, and close their restaurants permanently because they could not take the additional risk of the personal liability. And yes, uh, we were all shocked that indoor dining has, uh, was, did not start on July 6th when we originally passed Local Law 55, as we thought it would. And it's taking three full months for it to happen. And then at only 25% capacity. But it has gotten the attention of landlords who have been waiting for us to open and open at full capacity. Um, but given that that didn't happen, this law is necessary to bring more and more landlords to the table and say, listen, you know, let's work out something because it's better to have that tenant who's been, who was always there for years who didn't miss rent at a reduced rent um, than an empty space. Uh, and you do not have the opportunity to go after us personally now. Uh, the bankruptcy lawyers are going to be very, very, very busy. Uh, so all this is, the, the, the bill is very important. The law is important. And, and this intro is extraordinarily important. Um, 
it could be the single most important thing right now, preventing that one third, you know, a, a number from happening. And it's something we could do locally. We don't need state and we don't need federal approval for it. As to, as to the larger, you know, overall issues that you were talking about, um, we do need a Marshall Plan for small businesses uh, in order for us to get back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci has basically warned us that we're not going to be normal this year and we're not going to be normal next year. It's probably not until January 2022 that we're going to see a level of normalcy. We had 65 million tourists who came to New York in 2019. That's not happening in 2020 uh, until there is a worldwide effectively distributed uh, vaccine. So we, we do need a Marshall Plan. Um, I think we're going to need new uh, new leadership in Washington to effectuate that Marshall Plan. Uh, but there are things that we could do here locally and things that we could do here locally now. Uh, Andrew touched on some of them. Um, I want to reiterate, uh, some cost money for the city, but some don't. Uh, clearly suspending all fines that are not safety related. Um, a regulatory review. Uh, that might cost some money, but it's something we should do, and we should do it now. Uh, we should eliminate the commercial rent tax for those businesses in Manhattan who are particularly uh, struggling um, because they are tourist-related businesses. You know, Times Square is a ghost town. Midtown is a ghost town. We have clients who say, even if it was 50% capacity, I'm not going to open my restaurant in those areas because there's nobody there to come to the restaurants. The offices are closed. Um, it's a chicken or the egg type of situation. The offices don't want to open if there's no place to get a cup of coffee or, or buy your lunch. And, by, and, and yet we can't open because there's nobody there. So we do need to get rid of that discrimination on that commercial rent tax for South 95th Street in, in Manhattan. Uh, we need to... We need to stop discriminating against our New York City businesses compared to the rest of the state. So that means passing that legislation, which allows us to have the same rights as everybody else does in the state and have a clearly disclosed COVID surcharge, you know, temporarily during this crisis. It means eliminating the alcohol franchise tax, which is not a lot of money. But why should New York City businesses have to pay a tax for the privilege of having a liquor license, which we either way, we pay double the rest of the state for the same liquor license. Um, yet uh, nobody else in the state has to have a, you know, a liquor franchise tax. Um, we need to reform the sidewalk cafe process. Um, I don't know that we're going to permanently never go back to having sidewalk cafe licenses. My guess is someday we will. But that process needs to be reformed so that people can open faster. Right now, if you have the mistake of opening a business, and I put a mistake in quotes, in April or May, you can't get your sidewalk cafe for the first season that you're open historically. That's silly. You know, we have to have process where people can operate on a pending status. Um, we need to have winter outdoor dining. When we did outdoor dining, and the city was great with that, Polly Trottenberg, DOT, I give them all kudos, the mayor, uh, you know, you guys pushed it, pushed them into it, for sure, but they responded, you know, no question about it. They responded, you know, aces. Um, but, you know, understand that we anticipated that we would have months of indoor dining at 50% capacity along with the outdoor dining and together that would get us through the winter. We didn't anticipate having only outdoor dining until the weather got cool and now only 25% indoor dining. Um, so all these things we could do and then there are some things that we could do as a, as a city, council, mayor, going to the governor and saying we need some reforms at the SLA that discriminate against New York City. I'll give you one quick example because I know I'm taking up too much of your time. Uh, one quick example is outside of New York City, if I apply for a liquor license, I can get a temporary to, to start operating my businesses within about 30 days after I filed the liquor authority, if they reviewed the application and seen that everything is there, uh, while it takes them four or five months to review the application. The law does not allow that for New York City. It's absurd. Even if I'm taking over a space that is now vacant, but used to have a liquor license, still not, still no, no opportunity for a temporary. 
And, and the temporary is not issued until after you've had community comments. So you, we're not cutting anybody out. So there are a number of things like that, which the governor could do, by the way, immediately with exec, by executive order, that I think we, we all need to start lobbying. But together, we need to start thinking about a true Marshall Plan, which will clearly involve the state and federal government and a lot of money. Thank you. Pass this bill. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the council members, we'll move on to the next panelist. Seeing no hands raised, I would now like to welcome Jane Locke to testify, followed by Ayun Kim and then Edward Klein. Jane Locke, you may begin. Hi. Um, so I'm uh, our small business. I mean, uh, and I really appreciate um, uh, Chair Gomez for mentioning this, but. We're a small property owner and our family is, all, is also a small family business. My siblings and I, like and my father, shovel and salt the sidewalks during the winter time. My sister and I do the billing and accounting. And even now when our tenant hasn't been maintaining sidewalks because he's been closed, my dad goes out once a week to go pick up the garbage and the litter on the sidewalks from the outdoor dining nearby that's been happening. And this, a bartender of ours who has owed rent since February, 2019, and has received PPP money, but has not paid any rent since April or opened or attempted any outdoor seating at all. We've tried to negotiate with them and say, hey, you know, how about we work out like a discounted rent for this year, maybe a one to two year extension at least to make up for the fact that this year is probably gonna be a terrible year for you and it's like a lost year, um, you know, or something like that. And he just completely shot it down and said, I'm not paying you a single dime during this pandemic because I can't operate as normal. And so, the only thing that he was open to was unless we wrote off a majority of his arrears from all the way from 2019 to now, and then to give him a permanent rent reduction along with an additional 10 year lease, he said he would just return the PPP money to the government rather than pay any rent he owes. And the thing is, I understand that the business is difficult. I run myself another small business. And for us, our revenue dropped 80% from April to June. And even now our business is roughly 50% of what it is at this normal time of this year. And it's been a huge shock, I get that. but. I haven't gone and assumed that rent is free because it's difficult now. And it boggles my mind that like the assumption is that a small business owner, you know, it's been five months since all this happened and like you should be working this stuff out. Either you work it out with your landlord with deferrals, discounts, figure out something that's acceptable with parties because the honest answer is most landlords know that if you kick a tenant out now, which you can't do, um, but if you do, there's probably not many, many people coming to fill that space. And so there is, already incentive to move to the table. And we have a huge property tax bill coming up and we already use and borrow money to help cover the recent July bill. We are already in going into debt to cover our insurance bills. And really we have the risk of losing our assets if we don't, even though our business income has been zero since the lockdown started. Our tenant won't even use super low interest government aid that is completely forgivable, essentially free money to pay his bills to us because he is untouchable thanks to the protections that New York City Council thinks his small business deserves, but our small business doesn't deserve. To us, that, that's, a, that's a double standard. And really, to me, it's like a kind of discrimination. And this is what I think Chair Garnish pointed out earlier that was actually really moving because nobody seems to acknowledge that. I mean, for anyone who claims to support minority and women-owned businesses who say they support small business, who want to avoid displacement, our family and our business fit all of those things, but somehow we don't deserve any of that. Like our family has been in this neighborhood for decades. We've always wanted to stay. We've always said no again and again to developers who want to buy our property over the years. My parents were immigrants to the US who came with nothing. They spent, you know, worked six or seven days for decades paying for this property. And because of this kind of targeted, like discrimination against our family's business, we're being pushed further and further into that that we can't afford. And we probably, we're thinking about selling our assets to get out of the hole because we can't afford it. And there's no protection for our assets. And even though we're undoubtedly gonna be shortchanged. I literally have a meeting this evening to maybe discuss the sale of a property with, uh, with the developer because we, we, we aren't even able to borrow more money from the bank to keep ourselves afloat because the banks have told us because of the laws that the council and everybody has passed, you, we don't believe that you have ability to pay any sort of mortgage or anything so that we can't even stay afloat. And the sad thing is at the end of the day, if we have to sell and we sell our business to a developer, our tenant isn't gonna stay around either because the developer wants a vacant property so they can build whatever they wanna build. So because of that, you're gonna get displacement, not just of our small business, but also their small business. So for those reasons, I am not in support of the personal guarantee bill passing. Thank you, unless there are any questions from the council members, 
we'll move on to the next panelist. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Luck. And uh, um, I understand but you said from 2019, your tenant has not paid rent. Did you begin legal proceedings at that time? Hello? Yes. Okay. So it's not that he's completely not paid rent. He's fallen short and we've We've tried to, you know, it's not our intention that when someone drops off a little, we just kick them out right away. And that's what everyone wants to believe, but that's not the case. And this is an example of that. He's fallen short and we said, okay, you know, would you catch up? He says, yes, yes, yes. And then we say, okay, you know, it's been some time now. I don't want this to keep snowballing or keep, you know, kind of rolling around. He's like, oh, we're, we're working on it. We're going to get this. And it's been a year and we've given a year and it's, and now it's now. Thank you, Ms. Luck. I'd now like to welcome Ayung Kim to testify, followed by Edward Klein and then Kathleen Riley. Ayung Kim, you may begin. Ms. Kim. Kim. Ms. Kim, you're on mute. Does that work? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Jonai and the Committee on Small Business for convening this hearing. My name is Ayan Kim. I am the Associate Director of Small Business Programs at the Asian American Federation. Our mission is to raise the influence and well being of the Pan Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. In our rapid response, uh, rapid response efforts in the face of this pandemic, we have fa facilitated the distribution of over 320,000 masks and hundreds of thermometers to small business owners. We also set up a resource center for policy change and government assistance programs in language and continue to provide direct services for business owners who need marketing and administrative assistance. In the past month, we have also conducted a survey to assess the impact of the, of the pandemic on Asian small business owners across the city, which was tied to a $100,000 grant. Um, I'd like to thank um, Council Member Rivera for the pre-considered bill. The Good Guy Clause is an especially pressing issue for immigrant small business owners as well. And as we welcome this effort to extend this protection, I would also request for an ample outreach to the immigrant communities to make sure that all small business owners are aware of their rights. I also recognize that there are difficulties that other small property owners face, such as the story we have heard from Ms. Jane just now. And we want, to uh, we want to recognize this difficulty for the small property owners and also encourage the council to fac facilitate an assistance for the smallest of the small property owners as, as uh, much as possible. But we need more protective measures to serve as a safety net for the more, most vulnerable small business owners with little access to meaningful assistance. And I'm here mainly today to talk about the way that the SBS and the current administration is failing to meet the demands of the small business owners that do not speak English and that do not uh, that are not part of the big wheel or the system of lobbying and talking to the um, main government um, government agencies. We have seen that the SBS employee retainment grant was closed in just two weeks without meaningful effort to assist those unable to apply due to language barrier. Since then, the SBS has been guiding small business owners to seek assistance through federal programs such as PPP. What do we have as a result? We see zip codes with the highest concentration of Asian small businesses such as Flushing with the lowest approval rate for SBA loans in all of New York City. Even the commercial lease assistance program, which we support and we, we are welcoming the refunding of, we must say, we must pro point out that there is not any language assistance there either. And our small business owners, even when they do connect them to the program itself, can't get any meaningful assistance because they are not able to speak and communicate with the attorneys in this program. Immigrant small business owners with limited English proficiency are lost at the lack, lack of language access because they don't understand what kind of policies are coming up and what kind of policies have changed and what their obligations and penalties that they will face will be before they are actually given that penalty. The SBS webinars that we heard about today with those webinars with language access are only available weeks after a new policy is introduced during which time our small business owners are left to scramble for their own 
whatever means possible to get information out of desperation. We have requested for webinars that focus more on what to expect during, uh, during inspections and to advise on the cure process in language. If it's not possible to give this kind of webinar in time, in real time, when all the other English speaking small business owners are getting the information. We're still waiting to hear from the SBS and look forward to working together to bring more, more relevant content to the immigrant small business community. Outreach to immigrant small business owners from the SBS also leaves immigrant small business owners out. In our survey of Asian small business owners in New York City, over 90% of our respondents have answered that they are not a member of BID or Chamber of Commerce. Yet we see very little opportunity for small business owners to directly engage with SBS other than the hotline system that the SBS talks about, which again is not giving a language, ex language access. Immigrant small business owners are also falling prey, prey to corporate, corporate greed that targets them for easy revenue. For example, Con Ed is billing exorbitant demand fees to can charge them for the same or higher electricity fees as last year this time, despite the fact that businesses are right now operating at like <clears throat> at a 30% capacity compared to pre-COVID times. <clears throat> to whom they're supposed to ask help for is still unclear, again, because there's not enough outreach to immigrant small business owners from this administration. We have uh, repeatedly pointed out <clears throat> from the Federation's testimonies in the past that there are hostile inspections that are resulting in tickets and fines for small business owners and that are cause causing a logistical and financial burden on already struggling businesses. We have pointed out that there are 311 complaints that automatically trigger inspections and that needs to be in check. We have not seen any effort from the SBS to work with other agencies to decide what's going to happen with this. Our small business owners are frustrated with hostile practices and lack of will to communicate during inspections. They are left with tickets and fines that they don't know why they got it. They are left with tickets and fines they don't know how to cure. New regulations that don't make sense are also putting our small businesses in jeopardy. The Korean Cleaners Association expects that hundreds of their members will be closing business this year because of unreasonable fire safety regulations, not because of COVID. Yes, COVID has made their businesses very difficult, but it's not just because of COVID. The city is also making it impossible for their business to survive. And the city is not helping them to uh, cure any problems that they can work out. With this, we recommend the city council and SBS to increase language access, to mandate same day re release of in language material, introducing new policies and regulation, fund community-based organizations dedicated to offering direct services and language access to immigrant small businesses with limited English proficiency. We also ask that the city fund CLA program partners to provide language access to LAP small business owners. We also want to ask for an increased outreach to immigrant small business owners through not just BID or chamber, Chambers of Commerce, but through C CBOs that are actually talking to the business owners that are on the ground that are not in the reach of the city agencies. We want to see more collaboration with other city agencies from SBS to reduce small business burdens through stream, streamlining permits and licensing promises, uh, processes and consistent practice of inspections. Thank you so much, Chair, for, your, for our opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the council members, we'll move on to the next panelist. Seeing no hands raised, I would now like to call on Edward Klein to testify, followed by Kathleen Riley, and then Louise Fabier. Edward Klein, you may begin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Klein. I'm a real estate owner in this lovely city of ours. I'm a managing member of a law firm, and I'm a promoter and founder of a higher education initiative for several hundred adult members of the Jewish faith. I have close to 100 people in my employ in my various endeavors. Suffice it to say, and this might come out a little bit harsh, but suffice it to say that with the original passage of the guarantee law and the proposed extension of the law, I do believe that many business people are coming to the conclusion that New York City is no longer a place to conduct business. Now, a pause before I continue to explain that sentence. My sympathy and the sympathy of all my Mr. members- Mr. Klein, you're not very audible. If you could speak a little closer to the microphone. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, is this better? 
Yeah. Okay. It's a little better. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, my, my sympathies go out to the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers who have suffered pain and death. Our community actually has suffered very, very badly in March, April, and May of this of this year, as much as any other community throughout the city. So the sympathy is there, and the understanding of all the problems of all the people in the business world is high on our agenda. So what I'm about to say is not intended to diminish or degrade or downplay the pain and suffering being suffered by many New Yorkers, financially especially, as well as physically. Um, you know, with the grace of God, we should get out of this, uh, this muck, this plague as quickly as possible. But when the, the official legislative arm of this great city of New York abrogates contracts that have been entered into consensually between members of the business world, we're talking about business people, not talking about residency, residences, this is essentially focused on the business world, then the time has come to reconsider New York City. The council's wholesale cancellation of tens of thousands of contracts, maybe even hundreds of thousands, in the form of leases and guarantees is a massive rewriting of most of the commercial real estate relationships in this city. It, it's simply wrong. It's not, it, it's, you can't just tear contracts up and try to start over again. Notwithstanding the, the, the negative outfall, fallout of, the, uh, of, of, of COVID. You know, property owners, large and small, all types, all stripes, all colors, have financial obligations to maintain our buildings. We have to maintain the buildings for the tenant's benefit. We have to maintain the buildings to comply with federal, state, and local laws by the hundreds. We have to pay taxes, real estate taxes, payroll taxes, insurance, upkeep, superintendents, staff, on and on and on. The city council, by having passed the law six months ago, the original cancellation of guarantees, and by considering this extension of guarantee cancellation, is interfering with every landlord's constitutionally protected contract rights. They're reallocating the risk of all these losses from tenants to owners by suspending payment obligations up to tenant guarantors. You're suspending hundreds of millions of dollars of tenant obligations. It's not a, a temporary cancellation. That's a misnomer. It's, even, it's not even true. You're suspending hundreds of millions of dollars of obligations. And it's being done at the expense of depriving all owners, practically, of a critical, critical form of security for their lease obligations and their own ability to pay their own expenses of their properties. Many of the speakers who have come before you, Mr. Donash and all the others, have stated that 80%, 70% are not paying their bills. Well, where do you think that leaves the landlords? How are they supposed to pay their bills when 70% of the tenants, commercial tenants, are not paying their, their, their obligations? Uh, the council members also respectfully need to understand that the pummeling of this one industry, the real estate industry, through various statutes, because this has to be taken in the context of all the other uh, statutes that have been passed by the state, uh, even though the New York City Council doesn't have direct responsibility for the state, they're causing much of the real estate industry to flee New York. I mean, if you have to lose money on your investments, you're not going to stick around. You're not going to stay. We're not talking about breaking even. We're talking about losing money when laws like this are passed. You can't survive losing money. You're going to lose your building to a foreclosure. You're going to lose your building because you're going to sell it because you can't afford to feed the building when it's having a negative cash flow of 10, 20, 30%. Nobody has that kind of money, with the exception of some of the really big landlords. But that's not what we're talking about here. You've already seen sales activity and leasing activity and any other type of activity decline in 2020 versus 2019, not just because of COVID. Of course, COVID is part of the responsibility, but also due to the New York State, again, this is not the city legislature, but the New York State legislature's total rewriting of the law in 2019 to the benefit of tenants and to the detriment of landlords but also because of Governor Cuomo's essential freeze of the legal system in terms of freezing evictions for over a year and, and freezing the system. The system's still not even working in, in terms of getting tenants to pay their rent in court. Make no mistake, I'm not looking here to be critical of those trying to support COVID victims. You know, most of my staff got COVID. Many of my friends lost their parents. Many of my rabbis are no longer among the living who I gleaned from over decades. Those deserve protection in this terrible plague. But this particular law 
is the city council's attempt to continue to strip real estate owners of their rights and their income streams. Right? We can't afford it. You're conveying those rights and those income streams to the tenants that we serve. We serve these tenants. We provide space for these tenants to survive. And you're making it impossible for the tenants to be serviced by the landlords because the landlords just don't have the money to service them. It's a bold attempt at rewriting the relationship between landlords and tenants that have evolved over the last 100 to 200 years. One more question and I'll conclude. Why does the council constantly target real estate leases and the real estate industry? This is not the first time. Uh, I'm not gonna recount to you the four or five or six other laws by the city and half a dozen by the state as well uh, to, to essentially, essentially take funds from real estate owners, from landlords, small and large. It doesn't make a difference if you own two units or 2,000 units. To the exclusion of any other industry, you haven't done this to any industry. You haven't told the banks that they have to stop taking uh, payments on mortgage. There was a short moratorium, but that's over now. And you're not, you're not stopping the banks. You haven't required the insurance companies to pay the thousands of claims for lost rents. That affects landlords also. The reason that it hasn't been done is beyond me. I'm not sure exactly why not. But you have to look back, look at yourself in the mirror and ask, does that suggest that there's an animus for real estate owners? Whatever that might be. Whatever reason is, I'm not going to claim racism, anti-Semitism, that's nonsense. There just seems to be this, 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 this left concept of an animus for anybody who owns anything. If it's not an animus for one industry, then please tell me why not. I'm happy to hear why not. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, it's time to wake up and smell the roses. Your statutes, such as the guaranteed law extension, are doing extraordinary damage to the entire fabric of business. Yes, you're helping the tenants. Uh, some of the commercial tenants stay in, but not all of the tenants would go out of business. Many of the tenants that are using this as a club against their landlords are not going out of business and are doing okay. It's not only restaurants that are affected and, and benefit from this law, read the statute carefully. It affects many, many other classes of tenants. As a matter of fact, so much so that we, it was Rebney and along with several owners brought a federal court action against the original law of which arguments of two hours worth were heard on Friday, which I listened to. And the judge was not terribly happy at the fact that it's really an extraordinarily overbroad law. It wasn't carefully crafted. It's not a carefully uh, uh, understood or carefully acknowledged law. It's very broad in its scope and affects hundreds of thousands of people, much more than th those that really need it. Please understand, please try to understand the extraordinary damage being done to the commercial fabric of business in the city. Please reject the extension of this bad, bad law. Thank you for listening and thank you for understanding. God bless everybody. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the council members, we'll move on to the next panelist. Seeing no hands raised, I would now like to welcome Kathleen Riley to testify. After Kathleen Riley, I will be calling on Louise Fabier and then Bram Robinson. Uh, Kathleen Riley, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association. And coming up on six months since the stay at home orders were imposed in response to COVID-19, the restaurant industry is still one of the hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, we know how much the restaurant industry means to the city and the culture and its economy. And we have to believe that all levels of government will find a way to support this industry. With that goal in mind, we're testifying today in favor of extending the personal liability protections until March 31st, 2021, and on the overall state of our industry grappling with COVID-19. First, to address the pre-considered introduction, NYSRA is wholeheartedly in support of extending the provisions of Local Law 55 until March 31st, 2021. This law, which prevents personal liability provisions and commercial leases from being enforced against COVID-related defaults, has provided both protection and peace of mind to our New York City restaurants in the last few months. Without intervention, the protection would expire on September 30th. And while that date seemed reasonable back in April, we have unfortunately had a much worse summer than everyone had hoped. Between the outbreaks of COVID-19 around the country and the dire local economic situation, the summer served as a reality check that the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic will be much more extreme and long lasting than previously expected. The support to extend the protections of Local Law 55 is strong, and as early as June or July, our members realized that they would need such an extension to continue planning their recoveries. Thank you, Council Member Rivera, for introducing this proposal. In light of this being an oversight hearing as well, I'd like to briefly discuss the dire state of restaurant operators in New York City at this point in the pandemic. 
NYSERA has conducted periodic surveys to better understand the needs and concerns of operators across the city and state. In our most recent survey of 1,042 restaurants conducted in the last week of August, we learned that without a comprehensive relief package specifically for restaurants, 63.6% .6 said they're likely to close by the end of the year. Of those who indicated they are likely to close, 54.8% said they will be forced to shut their doors before November. In our earlier August survey, we asked whether restaurants expected to be profitable in the next six months, and a whopping 89.7 said they did not. Asked what relief measures would be most critical to survival, the operators identified commercial rent relief, business interruption insurance claims being paid, and an increase in indoor dining capacity as their top three priorities. For additional context on how this impacts employment, our survey from the first week in August found that 91.8% of restaurant operators had been forced to furlough or lay off employees since the COVID-19 outbreak began. And a majority, which is 54.7%, had to lay off or furlough 90 to 100% of their employees. 74.2% of operators reported no plans of hiring additional employees in the next 30 days. These numbers are stark and they paint an extremely worrying picture of an industry in a fight for its life. They also reveal an industry that has always been a cornerstone of the community and even in its darkest hour is continuing to act like it. Nearly every restaurant that's open right now is operating at net neutral or a loss, but still striving to provide what jobs they can and taking every necessary precaution to ensure the health and safety of their employees and customers. Even with all these pressures on our restaurateurs, their steadfastness in complying with state mandates has been laudable with Governor Cuomo's own task force reporting anywhere from 90 to 99% compliance in their inspections. All of that said, and acknowledging that the city is not in the position to provide the immense financial relief the industry needs, I'd like to briefly touch on a couple of areas where the city can provide assistance. First, we need clarity and foresight on outdoor dining. While Governor Cuomo has now granted New York City restaurants the ability to open their dining rooms starting September 30th, they will be at just 25% capacity until at least November 1st, if not later. This additional option for seating was greatly needed and we appreciate it as a starting point, but outdoor dining will remain a critically important avenue to supplement that limited indoor capacity. We need, as soon as possible, to get clear guidance from FDNY and DOT about exactly what will be required to use outdoor heaters in open restaurant spaces. We need, as soon as possible, for Mayor de Blasio to definitively say whether or not he will extend the open restaurants program beyond October 31st. We would encourage him to do so, but either way, we just need a clear answer. We also need all the support we can get, whether through SBS or otherwise, to make sure we reach every corner and every community in the city and every language, as was mentioned earlier, with the regulations for indoor dining. We have the month of October to prove that New York City can reopen indoor dining safely and successfully, and if any segment of our city's restaurant operators is left behind in the education and outreach efforts, it could be devastating both for their individual businesses and for the industry. In conclusion, NYSERA is grateful to City Council and the Small Business Committee for discussing Council Member Rivera's pre-considered introduction to extend local law 55. We're in support of this measure and we appreciate the committee taking the time to revisit the ongoing concerns of our small businesses across the city. I hope the dire situation of the restaurant segment has clearly come through in this testimony. It's an industry fighting for its life and we thank city council for keeping that in its consideration of this and other relief measures. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to call on Louise Favier to testify followed by Michael Brady. Louise Favier, you may begin. Hello, uh, thank you so much for listening to me today. I'm here to support the extension of this legislation. Um, in my particular case, we reopened after our forced closure and you know we're still losing money, uh, we're still struggling, but we know if we close our doors that you know everything we invested and all the jobs that the lovely people we work with will all be, uh, it will all be for nothing. So we'd love to try and keep holding on, um, you know, hopefully not losing huge amounts, even though we expect to continue to lose money throughout the winter. But if we get an extension of this, it would give me a little breathing room to decide whether or not I can, uh, how much we can tolerate uh, a slow winter. And it would give me a moment to decide whether or not I need to uh, really sadly throw in the towel. If with this September 30th deadline, it feels very pressured where 
I could be on the hook for, for so much money and do I need to decide to close my restaurant right now or can I take these months over the winter to see if we can survive? We know it, we're going to lose money for the next you know, six months, a year, maybe a year and a half. And then I have two businesses, one a small neighborhood bars, one in Brooklyn and one in Queens. And just in rent alone, we're in debt 100,000. And we have lovely landlords. One of our landlords to give us a rent break going forward, we had to become compliant on everything going back. And with our other landlord, we have, they've just allowed us to defer half of our rent right now. They've been lovely, but we've been paying half. But there's no plan for that, that all those bills will come down the road. So we've gotten SBA loans, which is lovely, but I'm 56 and their 30 year repayment time. And that means I'd still be paying them off when I'm 86, possibly with no businesses. I have no assets. I don't have a house, et cetera. So working at the businesses is really, really important to me. So I want to plead for the extension of this. Um, what the lawyer said earlier about these personal guarantees being kind of an end run around corporate law uh, that really just impacts small business owners because big corporations don't sign these personal guarantees felt very true for me. When we were signing leases, it was one of those things. If you want it, you have to do the personal guarantee. So we'd be very grateful to know there was an extension I do want to say thank you very much to the city uh, for the Open Streets program, uh, where we it's made a huge difference in terms of, you know, we're still losing money, but the amount we're losing is more tolerable. Um, we've appreciated the reduction, the elimination of sidewalk fees. Um, I would like to appeal for programs that give small targeted grants to small restaurants and small businesses. I feel like all our businesses, uh, all the information about us is all transparent in our bank accounts and through the city, all the sales tax we've always paid. Everyone can see what rent we pay. So it would be, it would take a lot of work, but I feel it'd be very worthwhile to offer small targeted grants. I have a small bar out in Washington state and we got $5,000 emergency grant uh, from our county um, to put towards inventory reopening. And we got an $8,000 grant from our city. And those amounts seem so small in the big picture of things, but they have transformed our sense of like, we can do this, we can come through this, you know, with, in addition to using our PPP money, it's like, okay, we're still losing money. And, uh, but, you know, if we could just hang in using our SBA loans, who knows, how many years we'll be paying them off, but we can only pay them off if our business is still open to do it. So I would appeal for small targeted grants. As many people uh, mentioned, a reduction in many of the onerous fees, whether it's all the taxes and city fees, uh, it would mean so much to for our landlord to be released from some of those so he didn't have to pass them on to us, his real estate taxes, et cetera, and, uh, and for us to be released from a lot of them. Uh, we appreciate the support. We have no idea how we're going to get through the winter, um, even with open streets. I mean, I'd love to put heaters, but we know in a New York City winter, um, I just don't know how much money we can afford to put into it. We will, of course, continue to invest. You know, already we spent a couple of thousand on each of our uh, open street structures to try and make them compliant with DOT because we'd heard from so many other restaurants that the awful fines uh, that they were getting we're very afraid of the SLA. Um, at this point, we've hired extra staff because we're so fearful of getting our liquor license revoked. We're so fearful of someone standing up accidentally while they have a drink that we spend a lot of time uh, making sure we're keeping people safe, but also fearful of uh, undue punishment uh, from the state. So this is to finish up. I just want to say thank you so much for uh, having given this law, it gave us a sense of security for a few months that at least we wouldn't be in a state of ruination and, and chased for the rest of our lives um, because we're already going to be paying off these SBA loans for the rest of our lives. Um, and so an extension of this would be, would be most grateful. I'd be particularly grateful if, uh, if good guy uh, clauses were actually um, eliminated. Uh, that would be a wonderful thing for small businesses and I appreciate your time and we look forward to more support from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. We've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez and I want to
call on Council Member Rivera, who has a question for you, Louise. Did we Louise, lose? are you still there? Okay. Yes, I, sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Carlina. Um, I just wanted to ask a, just two quick things. One is where what are your bars called? I know they're in Brooklyn and Queens, but what are the names? Yeah. Uh, we're in Ridgewood. We are, we're on Onderdonk Avenue in Ridgewood. So one of them is called Onderdonk and Sons. They're kind of, you know, old school type places. And we uh, are in the lovely community of Greenpoint, Brooklyn, um, at the corner of Greenpoint and Franklin Pencil Factory Bar. That's almost 20 years uh, old. And uh, Onderdonk has been there about five, six years. Excellent. Always looking for a long bike ride and <laughs> where to a destination. Okay. I also wanted to ask you how how easy, I, I just wanna say that I'm sorry because I realize how stressful this is. And I have personal experience with my husband who's involved in the restaurant industry. And that's the first time I had ever heard of a good guy clause and what it means and how it could really ruin someone in, in so many ways. So I just wanna say that I'm, I'm sorry that for the anxiety that this has all been putting you all through and, and to thank you for putting it into the perspective of regardless of, of what happens, um, you know, you have debt and you could be paying debt un, un, until you're well into your 80s. And I just feel like that is something important for people to understand right now when we're talking about survival. You mentioned an SBA loan. Was that easy to apply for, all things? Yes. Yeah, I, I thought they were quite, I mean, it was a lot of paperwork initially, but um, you know, we, we applied for all the city loans, the 75,000, that was a possibility, but none of those came through, even though we applied, you know, within the first 24 hours, but all the SBA loans came through, which, you know, is a really, is the only reason why we're still operating because, you know, we, we have no assets to be putting into it, but we have no illusions that it's still debt, you know, and, and our landlords are lovely, but they see the loans and they're like, you have money. We're like, yes, but it's not real money. It's debt, you know, that I will be paying for the rest of my life that I personally am guaranteed to pay. And um, so, yes, they were straightforward to pay for, to, to apply for. I felt that the SBA was, you know, it's the only reason that we are still standing um, and that uh, the businesses were even able to open the doors. But, you know, it doesn't come without a long term cost, which is that, you know, all that money, you know, just between the two businesses, a hundred thousand, you know, that's as you guys know, um, it's not like these businesses, you know, were making buckets of money anyway. Um, so, you know, thankfully they're low interest loans and I accept that this is the risk I've taken as a business owner and I could have just closed the doors and not reopened, but you know, it's my livelihood. These are my communities, you know, it's been a many years in it. So I'm I'm trying to see if if we could get through this year, like maybe by next summer, uh, you know, this open streets having it starting in May, you know, I mean, even if it goes through the winter, it'll only be good to us in May that we might actually start to recover. Absolutely, and I think that was the the vision for o open streets was to explore open streets dining and and permanent solutions. And I know that people sit outside during the colder months all over the world in other cities, and maybe not January and February because the parking spaces are filled with snow. Well, we can certainly figure out how to extend it um, in a responsible way. And, and thanks for your recommendation on, on small targeted loans. We're certainly gonna try to advocate for that. So that way you can get actual assistance instead of being kind of laden with more debt. So thank you for your recommendations. And of course, um, I'm glad it was easy to apply for the loan. And I think that's what, you know, this kind of chorus of making it as easy as possible, especially for those who might speak English as a second language um, to make sure that, that people can, can access those opportunities. So thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank oh, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Looking forward to going to the shops. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Michael Brady to testify. Michael Brady, you may begin. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Chair Joe and I, members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business, specifically Council Member Rivera, uh, thank you for this convening on the state of New York City's small business community. I wanna thank you both specifically uh, because I'm really disheartened by the lack of participation in the hearing by other members of the council. Um, it appears that small business may not rate among the other members, but I am really grateful for you both being here. 
Uh, as I said, I'm Michael Brady. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District and the Bruckner Boulevard Commercial Corridor located in the South Bronx. Collectively, these organizations represent a thousand South Bronx, largely immigrant owned mom and pop businesses. The work of uh, these organizations address the barriers for district small and micro business owners and build robust equitable economic development tools by demanding equitable city resources, safer and cleaner streets and responsible mission driven development. I'm also from the borough where the unemployment rate hovers at around 30%. And as a, rate, as a result of COVID-19 and a lack in equitable resource deployment in the, in the boroughs by New York City, I was able to be a part of a small group of individuals that have deployed roughly $20 million in grants and other resources to borough businesses and organizations. Our organization is helping drive systemic change needed to support equitable economic development in the Bronx. We organize and build coalitions, provide strategic community services, provide research and data analysis and support targeted advocacy efforts in strengthening community voices, building community power and helping to win economic development policies that invest in people as much as they invest in places. For the purpose of this hearing, we are supportive of the pre-considered pre extension of Local Law 55 to assist small businesses and landlords in navigating the very murky waters that exist in New York City by addressing the personal liability clause. As noted in our prior testimony when the legislation was first uh, passed, we would recommend that the City of New York investigate the legality in terms of contracts that may be modified as a result of this legislation. Much like the commercial tenant lease program, this is one step that must be accompanied by many in order to one, make New York City, uh, make, New York City make sense for small and large businesses, and two, provide a roadmap for the future of equitable economic development and neighborhood stabilization. These are steps which are good and we are so very grateful. But this is a piecemeal approach and does not represent a serious plan on the order of magnitude of us being the city of New York. New York's small business community is precariously close, close to becoming extinct. Sadly, New York City and the state did not mobilize early enough, nor have sufficient resources have been deployed to assist small businesses. This is a failure that we knew was coming. It's a failure that many of us wrote in letters in early March. This administration has sacked small businesses for both terms, introducing legislation that has raped the coffers, closed small businesses, jeopardized the workforce, and now when the tax base, a base that is generated by property owners and small businesses, when that is in jeopardy, the administration is shocked and horrified by the reality. This is sadly associated with politics and our city deserves better. We need real programs and resources to get New York City back on track. Unfortunately, just handing out PPE and referral services are not enough. And quite frankly, hearing, quote, we need to wait for federal assistance is not an answer, nor is that assistance coming. Additionally, New York City agencies need to stop finger pointing and playing the proverbial hot potato and be very clear and direct about the challenges New York City faces and the solutions that they can implement. There is a path forward. And here are some of the elements that we think are needed. Long-term lending in New York City under the direction of a robust financial control board. This requires both the state and city to put ego aside and encounter the real difficult realities of governing. It also requires New York City to bring, uh, bring about a pause on pet projects and take a look at a year of austerity measures. Quite frankly, from a business perspective, we don't trust this mayor with deficit spending. And we need the assurance that the Financial Control Board has the power needed to assist our city and maintain our long-term fiscal health. We cannot kick the debt can down the road. Secondarily, we must manage our city. We need to address quality of life and systemic matters like housing. In addition to addressing cleanliness and the safety of our neighborhoods, we must meaningfully address housing. There are currently over 13,000 empty units in New York City right now. If New York City were innovative and creative, we could acquire them through eminent domain under a state of an emergency and address homelessness challenges in real time. But our city fails to do this. Number three, no more debt programs. Businesses need grants and cash infusions, not more debt. Businesses, unlike New York City, cannot kick the debt can down the road. 
we must engage with philanthropy in a very real, very targeted way to provide resources to vulnerable small businesses and organizations. Number four, create a clear path forward for restaurants, nightlife, and hospitality. We have had six months to develop a plan, and now we have an extraordinarily weak program to move things forward. This is unacceptable for a, a city like New York City. Number five, finally address non-compliant street vendors. Assign locations, fix the licensing programs, have vendors pay into property taxes and pay into bid fees, end the underground and predatory vending economy. We know the path forward, why aren't we doing it? Number six, under a model similar to Liberty Bonds, invest in infrastructure and employ New Yorkers. Use deficit spending in a very smart way to invest in our city. Number seven, invest in citywide e-commerce models and cap third-party fees like Amazon Marketplace. Eight, we need a citywide COVID-19 commercial rent forgiveness program, which correlates into property owner tax credits. This is no longer something we can think about. It's something we have to do to move our city forward. Number nine, mandate same-day language access for all legislation, codes, and agency marketing materials for individuals where English is not their first language. It's not right to be held accountable for a law that is not communicated in your language. It's not New York City. 10, business in interruption insurance. Why we have not seriously addressed this boggles me every day. Where is our lawsuit against insurers? Where is the attorney general on this? Why have we not called the question in the courts? This is literally a $900 million path forward for our businesses. And lastly, number 11, handle property taxes. We've known for years that prop the property tax structure in New York City is broken. We've had commission upon commission to create a plan to address it, and we still have it. We must appropriately address property taxes to be adjusted due to the pandemic, and similarly, address a long or create a long-term strategy to create a fair and equitable system, not just a city piggy bank. Nationally and locally, both the healthcare system and the government were poorly prepared for COVID-19 and have been in crisis response ever since New York's first uh, case was identified on March 1st. We have the power and we can, are, have the brains to create a very clear and smart path forward for our future. It is my hope that this council and the extension of Local Law 55 will be a piece of that plan. But I must underscore that we need a real plan. The piecemeal approach just doesn't work. Thank you again for your time. I really do appreciate it. I want to thank you, Michael. Uh, you touched on so many issues there that I'm going to stay in touch and we continue to stay in touch as we have over the years. But Michael, tell me a little bit about the $20 million in grants in New York City. Uh, explain that one to me. Sure. Um, when the, so there is a there's a small group of organizational leaders in the Bronx that created the Bronx Community Relief Effort, and the relief effort was created uh, as a result of understanding that the Bronx wouldn't get resources, at least not equitable resources from New York City, or from from our state or federal partners. So we mobilized very early on with philanthropy and among an organizational network to raise and deploy roughly twenty million dollars. Uh, you know, to small businesses, organizations, to justice initiatives, to really make sure that we could deeply touch as many Bronx businesses and organizations as possible. And now because of those efforts, we've actually pivoted to creating the, the Bronx Foundation. And some of the efforts, uh, you know, this very specifically, uh, another panelist had, had referenced the cost of doing outdoor dining. Um, you know, we just two weeks ago for Labor Day weekend, we uh, launched our first open streets uh, program on Alexander Avenue in the Bronx, where the, the Bronx Foundation actually paid for the creation of the outdoor dining to the tune of about $125,000. I could not imagine if all those small businesses had to pay for that. And because of the success of that program, we're now ex ex expanding the open streets dining with the Rockwell Group, the Foundation and the Third Avenue bid to Melrose and then to Westchester Square. That's incredible, Michael. And I just, I'm a little taken back by the number of $20 million. And this is all grants. Yeah, it's, it's really uh -huh. astonishing when you look at um, New York City allocated $49 million to the entire city of New York, which is disgusting and gross. Uh, when a small group of literally ragtag people who are working full-time jobs um, were able to mobilize $20 million for our borough. It says a lot, Michael. Uh, and these are 
no interest payment grants, correct? Correct. No loans. These are no just. Loans. This is your business. You fill out a very simple application form. It's vetted and you have a check in your hands within three weeks. That is incredible, Michael. And maybe you should be sharing this a little bit with City Hall and this administration and how you did it and how to get it done within three weeks. We, uh, we've we tried. Uh, a lot of colleagues in government and in uh, philanthropy have, have written letters to the mayor and appropriate commissioners and the governor. Um, but as I stated earlier, um, I don't think small businesses win votes. Um, so I don't think folks pay attention to all, us all that much, except for when they want our taxes. Michael, we, we <laughs> thank you for that. I couldn't have said it better myself, but Yes, it's a, it's a bit concerning, the irony that we fight for small business allegedly in words and put no resources or real time and energy into it. And we'll continue this as well as something that I'm working closely on, which is the marketplace third party fees that are paid to Amazon, which would help uh, our small businesses. So, Michael, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Council Member. Appreciate you. Thank you. At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Joni for closing remarks. Thank you, CJ. Um, as we've all heard today, the difficulties that our small businesses are having, uh, that their very existence is being undermined. The only thing that's certain when it comes to small business is uncertainty, and we have all failed. Uh, I am gonna continue to fight with my colleagues to give every small business a fighting chance to survive this crisis. And I truly believe that if we wanted to, we could focus the time and energy to get that done. So I wanna thank all of those that testified, uh, the duration, uh, the city council staff, and all those that helped put this community together. This will conclude our hearing on the state of small business.